Welcome back once again to Prog Watch. This is episode six, and this week we feature an American band called Big Elf. Once again, I have my friend Dave Ledig sitting in the co-host chair. Again, Tone, great to be back one more time. Thanks for being here, Dave. Uh, so anyway, we're going to start off by talking about Big Elf a little bit. This band's been kicking around for quite a while. They go back to the 90s. Well, 91, I thought I read. Right. Out of the uh, tradition of glam rock. Somewhat, yes. Psychedelic rock. Yep, definitely. You're going to hear a lot of that in their music. Um, so the band was formed in 1991 in Los Angeles by Damon Fox and Richard Anton. Damon plays a lot of the keyboard and guitar, and Richard uh, was uh, the bass. He sang and played some bass. They were joined by A.H.M. Butler Jones on vocals and guitar and Tom Sullivan on drums. This lineup didn't last too long. Well, they did record an, an EP in 95 called Closer to Doom. And uh, after that, there was already changes coming. Sullivan left in late 95 and was replaced by a guy named Steve Frothingham, or for short, they refer to him as Froth. And uh, soon afterward, one of the founding members, Richard Anton, split the band too. So they kind of continued on as a three-piece and recorded an album called The Money Machine in summer of 1997, which wasn't actually released until around 2000. We're going to start off with that album, The Money Machine. They would, would, would count that as their first album. Um, if, I rec if I can remember my research properly, it actually... Um was picked up first by a, a label in UK before the Americans picked it up. Is that correct? I think it was Sweden. Sweden? Yeah. Now the point being uh, the American uh, people were a little bit behind on picking up uh, an American act. It's kind of disappointing now, you people out there who run those record labels. Yeah, actually, uh, it was a Swedish prog and heavy metal label called Record Heaven. That's that, uh, right. Yeah. Picked up Money Machine. And uh, released it in 2000. Yeah, it's it's a real interesting album musically. Um, Tone, uh, the, the the influences, I mean, you can hear them all over the place. King Crimson is all over this album. And when I speak of King Crimson, I'm talking about the heavy stuff, 21st century schizoid band stuff. Retro, uh, real retro Yeah, sounding. retro glam. Uh, Beatles. Uh, the Beatles. John Beatles. Lennon. You can, yeah, but the guy even some sounds of the, like that. Yeah, the uh, the vocal treatments are very Beatlesque. Yeah, some, you know some of the weirder stuff, like when the Beatles were putting stuff through the the Leslie speakers oh, yeah. and try, you know when like, Lennon was doing Tomorrow Never Knows and wanted to get it to you, sound like uh, someone speaking from beyond the right. grave or whatever. Musically speaking, it's it's really, in fact, when I'm sitting there listening, all I could picture was. Uh, like if you if you've seen the videos from the late '60s that bands were doing, very like psychedelic. Even if the band itself wasn't psychedelic, with the the real fast zooms on on the artist, uh, <laughs> the, the the different color. Like Austin uh, Powers. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Baby. And when you listen to this, this album looks like it would have came right off an Austin Powers movie. It, it it is a definite. It's definitely a retro sound. Um, but I guess. Instead of talking more about it, I, I guess we'll let you listen to the first track. It's called 
another nervous breakdown and it's from the money machine which was released in 2000 Once again, that was another nervous breakdown by Big Elf from their Money Machine album in 2000. And I'm sure you heard what we, uh, Tony and I, were just referring to. Very Beatlesque. Yes. Beatles uh, very very Beatles retro. Yeah. yeah, there's Mellotron all over it. Very John Lennon as right. well, too. Yeah, you Strawberry Fields, Mellotron. You know, you have like the, you know, just the um, Recording on on like the flute sound and, and and some of that stuff. For you folks who like the Mellotron, you will want everything these guys are producing. Right, the Mellotron it's all right. is everywhere. In fact, even some of the reviews that I read uh, from people who bought their material uh, specifically praise yes the Mellotron because they thought it was a forgotten instrument. And for you keyboard players out there, I know my brother plays. He loves it. There's also a lot of organ a dark gritty organ it, it sometimes reminds me of uh deep purple your yeah. rye heap a little bit yeah uh, i was thinking about I, I couldn't think of your rye heap earlier when i was oh, listening. i love the heap i, love I, the I was heap. thinking they sounded like somebody else i had even asked steve because uh my brother steve who has been a guest on tony's show um in the past uh i was asking him how aware he was of steppenwolf because it sounded like that kind of gritty, gritty keyboard organ. on some right. of at least the hits that Steppenwolf had for you old time folks who remember those guys. Okay. But anyway, uh, I guess we'll move along a little with the history of the band. 
uh, after the Money Machine was released, the band went on tour in Scandinavia, and they uh, they kind of would hit it pretty good up there in Scandinavia. They were going on as a three-piece at this point, but they picked up a Finnish bass player named Duffy Snowhill. Mm -hmm. uh, he helped uh, record their next six-track EP called Goat Bridge Palace, which we're not really going to play anything from the EPs. We're kind of focusing on the albums. But uh, in summer of 2001, another big change came to the band because A.H.M. Butler Jones actually went into a diabetic coma while on tour in Sweden and remained unconscious yeah, until he died uh, on the last day of December 2009. Yeah, that's what a terrible, a that's a sad thing. Um, but he was replaced by a fellow called Ace Mark, who was also f from Finland. And this kind of left Fox, Damon Fox, as the main singer and songwriter for the group. Their next album proper was called Hex and was released in 2003. From that album, we're going to play a track called Black Moth. So here we go. Go. Yeah. 
And again, that was Black Moth from Big Elf's 2003 album called Hex. An interesting album in terms of you can see their growth here, but it's kind of funny to me because the growth seemed to me, whereas if the last album was like late 60s psychedelica, this is moving into early 70s. 70s. Rock. Like you can hear Sabbath. Heavy, 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 heavy guitar work. On bands that were kind of prog fringe, kind of like you're right, Heap, Deep Purple, right. Black Sabbath for sure. There's even a Zepp riff or two that I, can, I could point out on this um, album. So you can see their growth from almost like in a time. In fact, one of the on their website, there is a quote that says they're 30 years behind the time, five years in front of the uh, ahead. Right. And if you think about it, obviously, that makes a lot of sense. Things come back. Things you know, come back. Hopefully, we're going to help Prague make a comeback. Uh, Prague's been percolating for a long time, and I think it's actually picking up some momentum right now. And I hope to be involved in the uh, the new wave of Prague here. But, uh, yeah, like you said, you know, they could be 30 years behind and five years ahead of the curve. Um, it's possible. Yeah, I, I dug this track. I thought it was there was you know some nice moody uh, introduction with the, the keyboards and the guitar, and uh, you know it gets kicking. It kicks into a nice guitar riff, starts reminding you a little bit of Sabbath. You got the chorus has the wah wah thing going on, and then it was a really nice moody middle section with a, with some excellent guitar playing in the middle there. Yeah, I do have to say that uh, um, the album. And uh, the first one, it is, it's um, it's unique, it's a unique listening experience. Yeah, they're different. Uh, they're different, and I don't mean that in a bad way at all. Um, they're not typical prog, in, in, well, my definition of it anyways. They do get that on their last album, which we will cover shortly, of course. Um, but for those of you out there thinking about uh, looking into this, um, be aware that you're going to be buying something, as Tony said, that is unique and different. Yeah, and very retro. Very retro. <laughs> yeah, very retro. Very Austin Powers. But, uh, yeah, like baby. I said, though, I, I hear lots of Uriah Heep and Deep Purple, and I love those bands. And those are bands that yeah. were kind of on the fringe of prog, heavy prog, whatever you want to right. call it. But anyway, I guess we're going to move along uh, to the next album. was called Cheat the Gallows, which was released in 2008. And the song that we're going to play from that is called Black Ball. This is a Damon Fox composition, and we're going to let it roll now.
Cheat the Gallows, the 2008 Big Elf album. Um, again, you can hear, not only on this song, but on the album, it's almost like, again, they're continually moving further into the 70s here. Uh, There's a lot of Sabbath like well, again, guitar stuff. a lot like of Sabbath, and Tony mentioned John Lord, Deep Purple. Yeah, yeah, or uh, uh, or The Heap, who played with Ken Hensley. Yeah. Um, the album, um, again, it's continually moving along. Uh, you can still hear elements of glam, still hear, still hear elements of the Beatles. And I'm not just in glam, of course. I loved glam, Bowie, uh, sure. among others. Uh, and uh, for those of you... Martha Hoople. Martha Hoople. For I those of Martha. you who are fans of uh, Pearl Jam, you know how they came about. Andrew Wood, who was the lead singer of Mother Love Bone, was very, very much into glam. And you always wonder what would have happened if uh, Andrew would have been able to stay with us. Uh, obviously, there would be no Pearl Jam. But would Eddie Vedder have found a way to make a career for himself? So again, I, I, I really love glam. Um, and for those of you, it's like we were saying about the last song, it's a different sound. It's a unique sound. And it's combining all these. And sometimes, in my own opinion tone, I thought it was a little bit too much sound. Something that needs okay. to back off a little bit in some areas. Well, I, I liked it. Uh... I really like the middle of this song. They're, they they got into a nice Sabbath like middle section, and then it it kind of morphed into like a funkier, like almost Deep Purple, John Lord, Richie Blackmore kind of thing. Yeah. And then surprise at the end of the song, you start hearing horns and saxophones, yeah. which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, it's the second cut on the album, and uh, actually on my notes here, I really have. It's not really a psychedelic cut. Uh, 
some of the other things on the album tone uh, we might want to mention is there is a song on here called uh, I can't even read my own writing. Uh, maybe it's pure evil. Money is pure evil. Money is pure evil. Yeah. They, they they have a video on that. So again, you go that's to YouTube, a pretty cool song. Check man. that. That was I enjoyed that song. Um, a song later in the album that I really liked was called Hydra. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Um, again, crimson influences creeping back into that as well too. Um, even on my notes, this to me is traditional prog, Hydra, and even the the, the closing song, Counting Sheep, very lengthy piece. And all, talk about sounds, all over the map. Yeah. All over the map. Uh, sometimes I yeah, thought these I was... These guys throw in the kitchen sink, that's for sure. Yeah, I mm-hmm. thought I was listening to a Saturday morning cartoon band. Uh, then I thought I was listening to a rock and roll band. Then I thought I was uh, watching a band that does carnivals. Uh, Counting Cheap. Um, it's all over the... It's very interesting and very entertaining. Again, you need to listen to it. I don't just walk away saying, ah, it's not for me. They're an acquired taste, um, yeah. but listen to them. Okay, well, anyway, uh, a little more background on the band around the time of this album. They, they were picking up a bit of a cult following over in Scandinavia, and uh, they were touring, uh, let's see, they toured with Dream Theater. Yeah, in fact. On their Progressive Nation 2009 tour. Some of those acts, from what I understand, Tom, couldn't make it, so right. they filled in and became Dream Theater's number one right. opening act. Right, right. And that connection to Dream Theater would become really important for the last album. Because, again, there was uh, turmoil in the band. Ace, Mark, and Froth were gone. And Fox was pretty much unsure of uh, how he was going to continue. But he ended up, uh, around that time, I guess Mike Portnoy bowed out of Dream Theater. And he was very instrumental in encouraging Fox to continue on with the, uh, the Big Elf concept. Not so, turmoil town. Bands don't have turmoil, do they? <laughs> yeah. Not bands turmoil. are in constant turmoil. Being in a band's like being married to four or five other people, if you can just extrapolate that. And I'm sure most of you know that. <laughs> so anyway, on this album, uh, like I said, a couple of key members gone again, but Mike Portnoy actually comes in from Dream Theater, picks up the drum chair, and uh, they got Louis Maldonado, Maldonado uh, playing guitar. And from this uh, incarnation, we got the album Into the Maelstrom, which was just released earlier this year. We're going to play a song from that album called Already Gone. I woke up today, can't remember my life yesterday. Turning the page, now I'm starting to age I'm living through this moment, but I'm losing the race Time's running out and I'm ready for takeoff Heads in the sky
Gone from the Into the Maelstrom album by Big Elf, 2014. Uh, their best best album, yeah, uh, hands like down, in my opinion. Uh, wasn't didn't like the first two tracks much, but already gone is the third track, and it really picks up from there. And even in my notes tone, my first words are pop potential all over this one. Don't be surprised if you see this on um, a YouTube video somewhere soon, folks. Yeah, I liked it. Uh, the beginning was kind of ethereal. You know, there was nice acoustic guitar and mellotron and again those processed vocals which are a mainstay of the band yeah I, I i to me it almost sounded like a cheap trick in their prime okay so i don't mean that as a slight i was a cheap glammy, trick fan you know, yeah i, I like cheap um, trick. Yeah. but very popish dare i say even almost formulaic but it works um it's a good song and uh, it actually doesn't sound a lot like the stuff you've heard in the prior three albums. Well, I don't. I don't think you'd call this formulaic. It's there's too many like crazy musical changes involved. Where it's just, you know, I don't know. They had that that weird kind of thing in the middle with the ascending keyboards and and then and then you had all the piano and mellotron stuff and then and then that middle again, which is like referencing Black Sabbath once again. Yeah, you still got that mellotron all over the place. But I'm sticking to my guns. To me, it sounds like a cheap trick. The band, Cheap Trick, a good band. Uh, it seems it seems uh, that the song was written to be a pop song. And again, it works. I hope it uh, brings them the audience that they richly deserve. Okay. So uh, we're going to play one more song from this album because I, I was along with Dave. Uh, this was kind of my favorite album. Um, and this song is called Alien Frequency. And it's also from Into the Maelstrom. What if you could be Jamaica? What would you have to say? Who am I? Who are they? Where do they come from? What's beyond the Milky Way? Are we the only ones? Is it real life or fantasy? Is there a God behind the sun? Oh. Frost and wall is telling me all So I keep to 
again, that was Alien Frequency by Big Elf from their 2014 album, Into the Maelstrom. Yeah, obviously you heard some, uh, again, Black Sabbath elements to this song. Right. Uh, one of the things that uh, you're all probably aware, your regular listeners of Tony, Tony likes pulling out the odd track here and there that kind of is different compared yeah. to what you're in. In my opinion, Alien Frequency is kind of one of those tracks. Yeah, it definitely has some uh, spacey kind of stuff. I liked it. I thought it was cool, spacey beginning. Um, I like some of the things he's singing about, too. Are we the only ones? Is there a God hiding behind the sun? You know, and he's uh, tuning into his alien frequencies every night. Um, interesting subject matter. Catchy chorus. Very catchy chorus. It's a good song. Uh, even for as much as I might criticize Tony for his uh, pulling out some of these oddball songs <laughs> once in a while, this was a good one. I did like it. And from here, the rest of the album, I think, really prigged up. Uh, picked up and moved into what I would consider uh, what traditional prog is. It really takes off from this point. Uh, the next, what, five, six songs, what I would consider, like I say, traditional prog, what you would expect. Tony has no comment on that. <laughs> we, are, I mean, we are in disagreement. We are in disagreement. Well, at least it's, he wasn't running to the bathroom. It's thirsty work. Well, at least he wasn't know? running to the bathroom. It's thirsty work. Um, the but I did like the album uh, way better. Uh, and I do mean way. And I, I enjoy the other ones. But the other ones to me is kind of like... Uh, Beer. I'm not a big beer fan. Uh, I shouldn't say that in front of Tony. Tony's a huge beer fan. But I drink beer to serve a purpose, to catch a little bit of a buzz. It's, a, it's an acquired taste. The first three albums, to me, Tony, were like that. This album is like fine wine. It's just smooth and perfect all the way down the line from, I guess, it's the last three quarters of the album, to me, really flies for Prague. Yeah. And it's a good thing uh, that Damon didn't hang it up, you know, so we can thank Mike Portnoy for... Uh for keeping his muse going there. Yeah, you wonder, uh, is, is it any coincidence? No, uh, that, that they made their best album, you know, with Mike Porton. I mean, obviously, Mike Porton was great. He's been involved with a lot of really killer prog right. projects. Uh, aside from Dream Theater, he's also in Transatlantic yep. with uh, Royna Stolt from the Flower Kings. And uh, who played bass in that? I think that was... Uh, yeah, I'm old. It, it's a... At all time. If any of you have cures for all timers, please write in. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was kind of like a prog super group, that, that thing there. Um, you, if you, you haven't heard it, you should. Transatlantic, it's really good. you got to wonder, like I say, uh, obviously I agree with Tony, probably had a lot to do with it. Whereas on some of the other albums, I thought there was too much going on. He seems to have come, come in and, you know, maybe he didn't have anything to do with it, but he pared it down to where, like I said, this album is like way, and the other albums are good, but I think this is way better than the other three. Okay. My opinion. Yep. All and again, you can check them out on the website. Go to the, uh, the all the bands that Tony features. They all have their websites. Uh, go to the websites, buy their music, uh, buy their T-shirts. A lot of them are very open to uh, comments, uh, feedback. Go to their Facebook page, like them on Facebook, and of course, let us know what you think as well. Right. Speaking of feedback, I got some. Yeah. From Thank you for our one fan. <laughs> <laughs> I had another. Well. The other email I got was, I guess it doesn't count. It was my sister-in-law. No, that's okay. <laughs> okay. But anyway, I actually got an email from a fellow called Angus Prune, and I guess he's from the UK and a huge fan of Big Big Train. And he called me out on some erroneous information that I was spouting in the uh, the Big Big Train episode. Uh, I was uh, crediting Greg Spotton for playing a lot of the leads, and actually Greg does not. He's very much part of their sound. He writes, he, he's, a, he's a big writing uh, force. force in the band. Thanks, Dave. Um, but actually, it's interesting that on the last few albums, uh, Dave Gregory, who used to be in XTC, has kind of become a member of Big Big Train. And uh, he's the one who's playing those fantastic leads that I love so much on, like Judas Unrepentant and some of those other tracks. So I want to thank Angus Prune, and I want to encourage everyone else. So if you want to, Angus, I'll punch him out a little bit here for you. Rough him up a little bit to <laughs> make sure stuff like that don't happen again. Anyway, I will endeavor to be more accurate in the future, is all I can say. Uh, but thanks, Angus. And, uh, hey, if any of you uh, 
anyone else catches me uh, spreading falsehoods, please let me know. Yeah. Or if you have suggestions, I, I would really like to hear suggestions. Yeah, you don't have to call us comments. Out, yeah, you don't have to call us out on corrections. Other information that we don't know. Yeah. Uh, that would uh, really be uh, enticing to uh, the other two people to listen to us. <laughs> um, let we have us a know. few more than that. These let days. us know. Uh, uh, shows like this are driven by feedback. Right. Um, please, you know, take a few seconds. Just drop us a line. Criticism is welcome. It'll make us uh, better for you as a listener. Exactly. That's what we're trying to do is make the show better. And uh, by providing feedback, you can help us make it better. That'll just about do it, I guess, for this week. Once again, I'd like to thank my co-host, Dave Luttig. And again, I'd like to thank Tone for having me over once more. It's a pleasure. Uh, so until next time, keep progging. Take care, folks. Have a good one.